I'm Brian Mallow, and I'm talking to Dan Sepka, who's a paleontologist, formerly from here in the Triangle near Raleigh and Durham, where, where I'm located, but now he is the new curator of science, science, at the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut. Hey, Dan. Hi, Brian. Good to be talking to you. So, Dan, we miss you here in the Triangle. You've only been gone for days, a week or two. How long have you been gone, and you already have a new paper out, and you're <laughs> making waves? A little more than a month, yeah. I miss you okay. guys too. It's a great place down in the triangle. So you have a new paper that uh, comes out today in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and right. it's about an extremely large bird. Yes, this is a paper on a new species called Pelagornis sandersi, and it had the largest wingspan of any bird to our knowledge that ever lived. And so this is pushing the envelope upwards in terms of how big birds can get and it's really exciting and and beyond being big it's it's a weird bird so it has it? pseudo teeth <laughs> the the mouth was filled with these um spike like projections and they look like teeth but they're actually made of the same material as the jaw bones so they're it would have been a really kind of dragon like appearance when it was alive really so now what's the largest bird today living bird so, so the largest bird in terms of wingspan is the royal albatross, and they average about uh, three meters in, in wingspan. And, and for comparison, our, our best estimates of Pelagornis sanders are about 6.4 meters. And so basically double the size of that animal. Um, maybe a more familiar bird to our, our North American audience would be the California condor. And that's a very similar wingspan, about three meters. So we're talking about, you know, take a condor, take an albatross, tape them together and <laughs> smaller than this new fossil species. Is that how science works? We tape these two together. Now we're getting great insight into the scientific pro process. <laughs> <We can. laughs> um, so, so there's, tell me something about how the, this was found and, and how uh, you got involved with it. So ironically, this giant bird was found at an airport, which is kind of tickles the funny bone. Um, the Charleston airport was being expanded and during construction work there, a Charleston Museum uh, volunteer named James Malcolm came upon this fossil. And later a team led by Al Sanders collected it and Al was the curator at the um, Charleston Museum at the time. He's since retired. And, and so this fossil was found in a really fossil rich layer that's also yielded things like whales, smaller birds like albatrosses and petrels, sea turtles, um, just a miraculous array of fossils. So that's kind of interesting because I know sometimes uh, scientists from our museum at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, like this, uh, later this month, they're going to go out in the field in Utah to a specific place and, and look for interesting fossils. Mm -hmm. um, so this was first found by non-scientists. This is found by construction people. Uh, at an airport, does that happen very often? And what happens? I mean, what if they don't care or what if they don't even notice? I mean, is it like there's a lot, like okay. here's the discovery of this huge unknown bird and it all hinges on someone caring that that something interfered with their job. Oh, well, so, so fossils turn up in these situations all the time when highways are being expanded, when people are just messing around on the beach. Many very important fossils are found by volunteers, and so that's why it's important for museums to have good relationships with amateur collectors because they make a lot of discoveries. You can go out to certain sites and look for fossils, but a lot of it is just chance. And so, you know, a lot of states have laws where when you're excavating in these areas, if you're coming across archaeological sites or, or burial grounds or fossil sites, you're supposed to alert the proper authorities. And so luckily in this case, someone said, hey, we're digging into bones here. And, and the museum sent out a team and collected all these great fossils. And so how much of the, I know that this is also another thing in paleontology, you don't always find complete fossils. How much of this bird did you find? Well, we have a very good percentage of it. So most um, importantly is the skull is just about complete. We're missing like half the lower jaw. Um, so we have, the, I think, the left half, not the right. But the skull's rare and the skull's beautiful, and that's a really important part for learning about the animal. And so we have the whole skull, basically. Uh, we have a lot of the wing. We have the humerus, which is would be this bone here on our, on our own um, arm. Bits of the smaller bones, we have the shoulder blade or scapula, we have the whole hind limb except for the toe bones. Uh, so we have a really nice 
percentage of the skeleton, and that also gives us a really good idea of what the proportions of this animal were. So we can tell it had an extremely long wing, obviously. Um, the leg bones were large in absolute terms, certainly larger than something like an albatross today, but on that long-winged body, they looked almost comically small. You just said something about the skull, about its importance in, in what it can tell you. Like, for instance, what could this skull tell you about this bird? The skull is very important for paleontologists because it can tell us a lot about things like diet. And so uh, knowing what the skull was like can tell us a little bit about what the animal may have eaten and, and its lifestyle. And in this case, it's filled with all of these tiny bony projections. And the bones are also very flexible. The skull as a unit is flexible. There's a hinge in front of the orbit, the eye socket. Um, there's a hinge at the chin, so the two sides of the mandible don't actually fuse at the tip of the jaw. And there's another hinge between the front and back parts of the mandible, so there's a lot of flexibility in this skull, and that suggests that the animal was probably resistant to, you know, thrashing, struggling prey, um, the forces that that would entail, and also may have been able to kind of ingest larger items, so, um, you know, gulp down a, a larger fish or squid or something like that. This is, this really goes to show in this... I mean, it could almost sound negative, but it, I don't mean it that way. That uh, that there's so much imagination involved in piecing together a story like this from the evidence you have. I guess that's what science in general is. All of science, astronomy, everything is like looking out at little bits of evidence and piecing together this big picture and drawing those kinds of conclusions. Well, so when we're talking about something that's extinct, we can't. You know, if we want to know how this bird flew. We love to put it in a wind tunnel. We love to watch it with our binoculars. And we can't do that because it's extinct. And there's no representatives of the family alive today. So we start with the bony skeleton. That's our direct evidence. We can get a very good idea of the wingspan of this bird with just the bones. And that's roughly 5.2 meters. So that's pretty rock solid because we can just measure those bones. Then there's less certainty about the feathers because in this case they didn't fossilize. And feathers can fossilize. Um, in this particular bird they did not Feathers generally are, are less resistant to decay than bones, so we have many fossil birds we know only from their skeletons. But we can get a very good idea of the boundaries about how long they would have been by looking at modern birds. And so when we plug that skeletal length into regressions based on feather lengths in modern birds, the, the total wingspan is somewhere on the order of 6.4 meters. And then to make it fly, you know, there's a cliche about standing on the shoulders of giants. In this case, I jumped onto the shoulders of Colin Pennycuke. Uh, he wrote literally the book, Modeling the Flying Bird. So he wrote the book about modeling avian flight. And he's done such uh, amazing research, both with real living birds, observing them in the wild, and also modeling uh, with computer models how a bird would fly. So taking observations from living birds, wingspan, um, mass, the conditions it's flying in. Is it at sea level? Is it up high? What's the temperature? Uh, where is it on the earth? Because the earth's not perfectly round. We can get a very good idea of how this animal would have behaved in gliding flight. And a reasonable idea about powered flight as well. So using that mountain of data that, that others have collected, we can get I think a pretty accurate picture of the flight parameters of this bird. Yeah, so that's a lot of what uh, your paper is about: is the is using computer models mm -hmm. to under given the dimensions of the bird, right? Figuring out the way it would fly, whether it would be flapping its wings or gliding. Right. We, I mean, we use aerodynamic theory to see what is its glide pole or uh, how, what's its lift-drag ratio like. So how <laughs> far could it glide per unit of altitude? How much energy would it be able to produce from its muscle mass and how much would it need to actually fly with flapping flight? And it probably couldn't fly continuously in level flight. So if it's in still air, it probably would not be able to keep itself aloft by flapping alone. So it needed to rely on some type of, some type of cheat harvesting energy from the environment using wind gusts or soaring on the boundary layer between the waves and the air and kind of renewing its energy that way. So we're sure it flew for certain, um, but it probably had to be pretty careful about what environments it was in. And that's because there's scaling laws. So the bigger you get, the more energy it takes you to flap your wings. But the amount of energy your muscles can produce scales up more slowly than that. So eventually the two lines intersect and you get to a point where in theory at least you shouldn't be able to just keep yourself aloft um, just aerobically flapping alone. Wow, and that's kind of amazing. This is all about a bird that, when did this bird live? It's roughly 25 to 28 million years old. So it's, it's after the age of the dinosaurs, um, but before human beings came along. 
And was there at first, I guess when you're starting to identify, you have these bits and you start to identify it, I guess you kind of, something you see helps you hone in on like a family or something. At what point do you know that it's not uh, a known described species? It's very easy to put it in a family. So the family of Pelagornithidae is the only family with these bony pseudo teeth. So okay. done. <laughs> and then figuring out it's a new species involves comparing it to what's known before. Um, the wingspan is a little bit of a giveaway. It's about 15% larger than previously known bony toothed birds. And so that suggests it's a new species. But many modern species of birds, um, it can be sexual dimorphism or just individual variation where. Um, you know, males are smaller or larger than females or something like that. So um, to figure out it was certainly a new species, they looked more closely at the details of the skeleton. It has, for example, more pseudo teeth, more bony teeth in its jaw than other known species. The articulation is a little bit different. Um, the mandible is a little bit more slender. And there's differences in the leg bones as well. So when you add up all of those, it's, it's a pretty clear cut case that this is something uh, different than previously named species. And then do you have more work to do on this specimen or are you on to the next thing? Is this paper the, the result of the end of what, uh, of, of your study of the specimen or? No, no, no. So, so, so um, it, we wrote, you know, this paper is six pages and, and there's page limits in different journals. And so I think the skeletal morphology deserves a, a more thorough um, description, and so I'll be working on that in the near future. Um, more images and more about what the bones are like and the differences and similarities between other birds. Um, beyond that, I'm, I'm all about the brains right now. So, so Nessent, the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, uh, recently sponsored a catalysis meeting where we brought 30 scientists who study bird brains together. And we're going from dinosaurs all the way up to penguins and seeing how the brain changes when you learn to fly, when you stop flying in the case of flightless birds. And so I'm really excited to be working with this tremendous team and, and we're going to try to um, put together a few collaborative papers that, that came out of that meeting. So that's that's what's next for me. But is the main thing you want us to, to know about what, what the, the current paper says is just about uh, the extraordinary size, possibly, I mean, the largest flying bird that we have found. I mean, the, by, I, by we, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get in on it a little bit here, you know. <laughs> I mean, we should recognize your work, Brian. <laughs> uh, the the main point of the paper, I guess, the one take home point is this: this expands the known wingspan for birds. So it, they're bigger than we thought they could get before, and that's just really cool. And and who knows? Maybe there's something even bigger lying out there somewhere under an airport or under a, you know under a railroad or something that we'll find in the future. We don't know that this was the largest. This is the largest we found. There could be something bigger out there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dan. I really appreciate it. Dan Sepka from the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut. Yes. And uh, the new paper is out uh, in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, PNAS. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks, Brian. Always great to talk to you.